This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by Casper, a sleep brand that continues to revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. Get $50 off select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash galaxy and using the promo code GALAXY at checkout. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 307 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing cities in fantasy and science fiction, and I'm joined by three guests. So, first up, we've got Sam J. Miller who you may remember from our panel on Sense8 back in episode 157, and it's our panel on Taboo back in episode 256. His short fiction appears in magazines such as Lightspeed, Nightmare, and Strange Horizons, and has been nominated for the Nebula and Theodore Sturgeon Awards, and has won the Shirley Jackson Award. His novels The Art of Starving and Blackfish City are out now. So Sam, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Then next up, we've got Lara Elena Donnelly, who you may remember from our panel on Writers Under 30 back in episode 242. She's a graduate of the Alpha and Clarion Writers Workshops, and her short fiction has appeared in Strange Horizons, Escape Pod, Nightmare, and Mythic Delirium. Her new novel, Armistice, a sequel to her debut novel, Amberlo, will be out next month. So, Lara, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be back. And also joining us today is Brian Camp. He's a graduate of the Clarion West Writers Workshop and the University of New Orleans Low Residency MFA Program, and his short story, The Independence Patch, appears in the March issue of Lightspeed Magazine. His debut novel, The City of Lost Fortunes, which he started in the backseat of his parents' car as they evacuated for Hurricane Katrina, is out now from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. So, Brian, welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. And today's show is brought to you by Casper. If you need a new mattress, just head on over to casper.com slash galaxy and order today. The mattress industry is famous for forcing consumers to pay high markups, but Casper cuts out the cost of resellers and showrooms and passes that savings directly on to the consumer. If you live in a city, and if you're anything like me, you've probably spent a lot of time living in an apartment with just a bare mattress on the floor. And if you're only going to own one piece of furniture, why not make it the best? Casper's mattresses are designed by humans for humans. The original Casper mattress combines multiple supportive memory foams for a quality sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. And why go all the way out to the curb to pick up a mattress when Casper will deliver one right to your front door? Your Casper mattress will be shipped to you in a small box, and all you have to do is open up the box and watch as the mattress naturally expands to its full size. So just head on over to casper.com slash galaxy and order today. You have 100 days to try out the mattress, and if you decide not to keep it, Casper will give you a full refund. Free shipping and returns to the U.S. and Canada. Terms and conditions apply. And remember that you can get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash galaxy and using the promo code galaxy at checkout. All right, so now let's get to our panel. Okay, and so I think everyone here currently lives in a city. So the first thing I'm wondering is just how does living in a city influence the way that you write cities in your own fiction? And so let's start off with Sam. What do you think about that? Yeah, so I'm a small town kid. I did not grow up in a city. And I remember coming to New York City as a kid and being like abjectly terrified of the city um, and the sort of like chaos of it and the, um, you know, the how many people were there and the poverty and the uh, all the crazy stuff that goes on in the city, especially in New York City. Um, and then, you know, as I as I grew up and got older, I began to really be kind of fascinated by and, and excited by all the things that made New York City so scary and so wonderful. Um, and so, you know, for me now as a grown up, I mean, you know, as a gay guy uh, living in a big Big city is kind of a much more natural fit than being in a small town. And so I think that the things that make cities exciting, whether it's the diversity, the complexity, the f food, the sex, whatever, like there's just so much about a city that makes it crazy and, and addictive. And that's, that really informs how I, how I write cities and how I write in general. And you're a community organizer, right? You want to tell us about that? Sure. Uh, yeah, I I work for a great organization that was founded and is led by homeless folks, and we organize people experiencing homelessness to fight back against uh, like bad policies that impact them, especially around issues of policing and uh, housing policy. So I spend a lot of time dealing with city government, whether it's uh, meetings with elected officials or agency commissioners or different stakeholders trying to get you know bad policies stopped and good policies started. So uh, the the sort of like horrors of the behind the scenes 
workings of a city are, are something I spend entirely too much time looking into. And then could you talk about how that specifically comes through in some of your fiction? Sure. I, I think that, um, you know, cities seem to function much better than I think they actually do. And if you are in a place, you know, it's very possible to sort of just like make your way through it and, and enjoy it. Um, and the closer you look at it and the more you get into all the things that are happening, the more you see just how much is horribly wrong and how many people are in really bad situations or are dealing with really awful conditions or abusive uh, problems that nobody cares about and nobody's doing anything about. And actually how much of a city is about people exploiting each other and, and some people making a lot of money while a lot of people are really struggling to get by. Um, and so the more you look into that, the more you get upset by it or or bothered by it. And so um, fiction is, is definitely one of the things, one of the ways in which I, I process my uh, anger at how you know, the imbalance of power in a city and in the world and how much I want to imagine a place where that imbalance can be addressed. Well, but so let's take your, your new novel, Blackfish City, for example. How does um, the housing sort of city underbelly kind of stuff come through in that in that book? Yeah, I mean, this is really my nightmare of how real estate and, and housing is like the ultimate evil of, of cities and that at the end of the day, that's really the prime mover for politics and, and, and most decisions that get made in city government are, are generally made with an eye towards maximizing profit for developers and real estate uh, uh, owners. Um, and so that you know, one thing that happens in this, in this futuristic floating city in the Arctic is that uh, – artificial intelligence uh, governs the city. Most of the most of the bureaucracy of city government is run by software. Um, and so in some ways that takes out a lot of the complications and a lot of the uh, corruption and, and, and bad things that happen in, in city government. In other ways, it just expedites and uh, enhances the ways in which uh, the poor are exploited and, and manipulated by the, the wealthy. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, in trying to imagine a, a future city, it's possible to imagine things getting a lot better, like the fact that maybe in a city that didn't have a racist police force brutally enforcing a status quo, we might, you know, policing might be better, but other things might be might not be better. Yeah, I mean, that all sounds really interesting. I think we'll talk more about the book as we go. But so let's get Larry in here. So Larry, how has living in a city influenced your Amber Lowe books? You know, what's interesting is that when I started writing Amber Lowe, I was living in a very small town. And about midway through creating the book, I moved to a smaller city. And I didn't move to New York until after I had sold the book. And I think that a part of what helped me create this city sort of from whole cloth was being so isolated from a lot of the things that I think a big city like New York represents and makes possible. So in New York, you can find people who do anything that you could possibly be interested in. Like if you are into some weird niche activity, there are people in New York who do it. Um, and it, once you move to the city and find those people, it can actually become kind of um, claustrophobic almost um, because there's only like one small group of people in the city who do that thing. And you're so excited to have found them. And then you sort of realize that they're the only people in the city who do that. And if you want to keep doing it, you're, you're a little bit stuck with them. Whereas when I was living in a small town and then in a, in a city that was much smaller than New York, um, I, I couldn't necessarily find communities who were interested in the sort of weird esoterica that I found, that I found compelling. Um, so I was free to just imagine any number of possibilities and like create the city where all the things that I loved and all of the things I was interested in could like manifest in whatever way I wanted them to. And then once I moved to New York, I was like, oh, cities are actually just conglomerations of very small communities. <laughs> um, and it was maybe a little bit of a, of a letdown. Like I love living in New York and I love having I love having all of these opportunities and possibilities open to me and sort of the idea or feeling that at any point, if I wanted to, I don't know, go see an opera or like see an experimental gallery opening, like I could walk out the door and do that. Um, but I think that there's an element of imagination that once you move into a city, you can't so much imagine cities from whole cloth anymore because you've been exposed 
to the reality. So moving to a city is a giant bummer, basically, is what you're saying. <laughs> I didn't say that. It's just different. Um, I think I think it's different than like New York is definitely held up as this like. Um, you know, it's the Big Apple. Like, it's where you go when you grow up in a small town and you want to go make it big or do something, do something different. Um, and I think there is, there's like an idealized city and then there's the real city. And in writing fiction, when I was creating a city, I definitely created, I create, I don't want to call it an idealized city. I just created a city of my imagination instead of letting it be influenced by the actuality of a city. And Amberlow has been compared to a lot of different cities that do exist, but in reality, it's just something I made up out of my head. Well, so I mentioned the, the, the sequel is coming out soon. So you wrote the sequel after moving to New York City, right? So it did that. Um, did you tweak the the nature of the city at all as a result of any experiences you had in New York City? So Armistice actually takes place in a totally different country. Um, and it's not, I think it's less concentrated in its, in its urban setting. Like Amberlo was very much a book that took place in, um, in this cosmopolitan environment. And you, you didn't really, you very rarely went outside the borders of the city. And in Armistice, there are people like flying airplanes to different places. They're taking trains. They're taking boats. There's two different cities, three different cities. There's a small town. Like there, it's a much more, um, spread out narrative. And it doesn't rely on the setting so much as, as like another character, I think. Um, so I don't know if that was influenced by moving to New York so much as it was the story was expanding and couldn't be contained in this insular setting anymore. All right. Well, so let's get Brian in here as well. So, Brian, same question. Uh, how I, so you, you live in New Orleans, is my understanding. I guess I could be wrong I do. about that. But yeah. So could you talk about how that influenced, I guess, in your case, that influenced the book in a very direct way, right? Right. Um, you know, in, in terms of just kind of in general, how living in a city uh, impacts my, my thinking. Um, I, I think it being that particular city, I, I think a lot about um, impermanence uh, and, and human impermanence, I think, uh, you know, when you, when you live in a, a, a more rural place, that's much more connected uh, to the landscape, you know, you, you are you're you're looking at the same mountain that your your father looked at and his father looked at and and so on in the, to the past but whereas in a city it's it's a constantly evolving thing it's a it's a created thing that can be torn down and rebuilt and um over over a period of just a few years it becomes a different place uh and there are there are commonalities you know but the so so take the French Quarter for instance. Uh, the you you would think that it's it's basically the same French Quarter that's been there since the you know the three hundred years of the city. But um, you know there's a lot that's changed once when you actually live there. Uh, and so for me that that makes me think a lot about you know the the kinds of constructions that we uh, we make both in the the literal sense of our our environment, and then you know the 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 overall humanity uh, of or the overall constructed nature of, of humanity. I think. Uh -huh. I think we should say that your book is set in actual New Orleans, right? Like unlike you know Sam and Lara's books are set in fictional cities, and this is set in the actual New Orleans, a sort of fantasy version of the actual New Orleans. Is that right? Right. Right. Yeah. So um, it's a it's a New Orleans where the gods of all mythologies kind of. Uh, coexist, uh, less than peacefully, um, but kind of behind the scenes. So, you know, uh, it, it is, it is the, the modern day New Orleans, but, you know, you might end up in the wrong place and, and there are gods or monsters or, or whatever there. Uh, well, so tell us about this thing about starting the book as you were evacuating for Hurricane Katrina. Uh, right. That was a good time yeah. to start a novel or? <laughs> <laughs> so I was in an undergraduate uh, fiction class uh, and taking a detective fiction class at the same time. Uh, and the we, we did a writing exercise that was just based on description. 
And so, uh, the, you know, my, my prof, my teacher, uh, Bev Marshall, she said, uh, you know, imagine the, the room and imagine the wallpaper and the, what is the air like? And is it cold? Is it hot? And describe the, what does it sound like? And what does it smell like? And you, you were, we're writing as she's saying all of these, these different things. Uh, and because I was writing a detective, I mean, because I was reading a lot of detective fiction, uh, I started describing this kind of seedy, um, backroom poker game. Uh, and the very last thing she said was, now put something in there that's not supposed to be there. Uh, and so I described the, the scent of cinnamon coming from the wings of an angel sitting closest to the door. Uh, and when I read that out loud to the, to the class, there, I got kind of a, the ooh reaction. And I was like, well, I, I, I kind of have something here. Um, and so our assignment, uh, for the next class was to take that scene that we had described and, and turn it into, or that, that little moment we had described and put it into a scene or a short story or, or something. Uh, and that weekend was the weekend before Katrina. So, um, a lot of people, if you're not from the Gulf South, a lot of people don't, don't quite realize that for the most part, when a, when a hurricane comes, it comes and it goes. And if you have the means, you, you evacuate and you come back. And so, you know, you pack for a weekend and, and some of your precious items and you hope there's, there's something to come back to, but you kind of expect that it's just going to be for a couple of days. And so I was like any college student, you know, I, I had my homework to do and it didn't matter what was coming, uh, you know, in, in hindsight, obviously it seems completely ridiculous that, like you say, that was a good time to start a novel. Um, but it, uh, as far as I knew, I was, I had homework to turn in on Tuesday and so I needed to get it done. And so, uh, but that that scene, that that description of the poker game, uh, is is almost word for word what uh, what ended up being in the novel. That's interesting when you're talking about the French Quarter because I like um, Sam and Alara. I grew up kind of in the suburbs. I didn't grow up in a city, and so there were just certain things that I didn't really quite appreciate until I I moved to New York City. And one of them is the is just how different the neighborhoods can be. I kind of I think I just sort of pictured cities as being just all kind of the same. And I would talk to people like I had a friend uh, when I first started coming into New York City, a friend who had lived in the city his whole life. And he would say, like, oh, well, this street is safe, but don't go one block farther because that's not a good street. And I, it just didn't make sense to me. I'm like, is what is there an invisible wall there or something like how does that even work? But then you come to the city and you're like, oh, that actually is exactly how it works. You know, like this street can be good. And then, you know, one block over, it's not good. And uh, there's just things like that that you don't uh, at least I didn't really appreciate until I, I, I moved here. Yeah, um, New Orleans is, 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 it's a really small city. Uh, it, and so, especially since the storm, um, in terms of population size, uh, and so that, that's really that, that aspect of cities in terms of, uh, you know, you can have these, these stately mansions, uh, and then just a, a few streets down, uh, a, a much lower socioeconomic area. Uh, is really that it, it's really in quite stark relief. Um, and there are, you know, I mean, I'm sure Sam can talk about this more than I can, but, um, there, are, it, it's getting much worse, especially in New Orleans now, um, with things like, um, the, uh, you know, short term rentals and, and things like that, uh, you know, taking in, taking out some of the, the housing and, um, yeah, so it can, it can really be a, a negative thing for a city. Well, yeah, Sam, do you want to jump in there? What do you think about this sort of idea of like the bad parts of town and how that gets portrayed in fiction? Yeah. I mean, I think that like, uh, every city contains many cities and most of those cities are like, you know, shaped by who we are and who our community is and who our people are. And, you know, what, what is safe for one person might not be safe for another. Um, and, and things that we think of as, as, um, you know, as safety for one person is not like some people can walk down a certain block without having the cops called on them and not think of it as unusual. Um, and other folks cannot. So I think that, at the end of the day, every city is a war. It's a whole lot of people. It's like people trying to exploit and make the most money off of people. And so the things that we love about a city, whether it's, you know, great restaurants, the bookstore we love, the record shop we go to, the bar where we hang out with our friends, the public transit system that we depend upon, um, all of those things are, are under attack all the time, right? 
Like, you know, one of the things that uh, exemplifies living in a city is losing the things you love, right? You walk down a block and you're like, oh my God, that restaurant I love is closed. Oh my God, that record store is closed. So, you know, someone is always trying to make more money off of every space. And so every store, the rent is always being raised. Every restaurant, the rent is always going up. Every place is trying to pay its workers less. Um, And so you know, these things that we love are constantly being taken away. And so it's this, this sort of fight of the things that make a city great um, are the things that cause a city to, to, to die really, because the more, uh, the more wonderful and exciting and vibrant and, and uh, wonderful a city becomes, the more people want to go there. So then the rents start rising and people can make more money. So they're, you know, suddenly the things that make a city awesome can't afford to live there anymore. What do you think, Sam, about how homeless people are portrayed in fiction? I feel like there's this trope of homeless people with magical powers. Is that something that you have noticed? Oh, don't don't get me started on representations of homeless folks. It is literally my job to talk about uh, ish, representation of homeless folks. So, I mean, I think that there's a lot of factors and there's a lot of problematic narratives around homelessness. Um, and so sometimes it is like, you know... Um, the 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 sort of attribution of magical powers to homeless folks um you know homelessness in new york city and in most places in the united states is hugely racialized you know 96 percent of the homeless families living in shelters in new york city are black and or latino um so narratives of the magical homeless person um are are very much sort of like uh connected to the problematic narratives uh like what folks have called the magical negro story um and and that also impinges upon talking about things like like policing, right? When when it, a community is heavily racialized, then they're uh, going to be targeted for aggressive policing. So I think there's a lot of messed up narratives around homelessness. Um, this idea that everyone is mentally ill and a substance abuser and shiftless and lazy. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, all homeless people are, are people who can't afford to pay their rent. And I don't know about y'all, but I always am stressing out about paying my rent. Um, and so, you know, on the spectrum of people who have a hard time paying their rent or people who aren't super wealthy, I think we're all on that spectrum. And um, those narratives about homeless people being, you know, creatures that once were men or alien invaders or zombies or violent crazies really help serve to keep us from seeing our, our solidarity with them and coming together and saying like, oh, wait, we if we all work together, we really could flip the script in this city and make it so that housing was affordable. Well, when you're talking about sort of like things that stress you out about living in a city, one thing that stresses me out a lot is finding parking spots. And I was, you know, and that's another thing that never really, I never thought would be a major concern, you know, coming from the suburbs. But I was actually thinking of a story idea the other night where there's a guy and he's driving around at night trying to find a parking spot. And this just goes on for hour after hour after hour. And then he realizes he's a ghost and he's doomed to drive around forever looking for a parking spot. But then at the end of the story, there's a crazy twist where he realizes he's not a ghost. It just really is that hard to find a parking spot. Oh, my (laughs) God. That's brilliant and really, really <laughs> horribly accurate. That's too real. Too <laughs> yeah. real. Um, but yeah, I don't know. So, so Lara, I don't know. What do you think about what we're saying here? Do you have any other city city things that you want to mention? Yeah. So the idea of of like the stark divide between even just like one block and another. I was talking to I, – I recently – acted as a mentor in the Writing in the Margins mentorship program, which is a mentorship program for um, writers of marginalized backgrounds who are trying to break into the industry. Um, and it pairs these sort of newer writers with with mentors who are already established, um, which was news to me. I volunteered to do this because I saw them call for mentors and I was like, oh, I I might like to do that. Um, and, and it was like big news to me that I was an established writer who could act as a mentor. <laughs> um, so I I was paired with this um, this writer and her book had a city in it. And it was a city that had been colonized by a foreign power. And when we were talking about her descriptions of the city... I kind of asked her for descriptions that would not only place me more firmly in this space, like would give me an idea of how it smelled and how the air felt and what the people did on the streets and kind of like made it feel like a lived in space. 
I, I asked her also, and I mean, this is part of making a city feel like an, a lived in space. I was like, what about the places in this city that make you suddenly understand what's going on here, right? What, how it feels to live in a colonized city as an oppressed person. Like there are tells in, in the fabric of the city for someone just walking around. And, and one of the examples I gave was like, when you're walking on the Upper East Side in New York and you cross 96th Street, you are suddenly just in a completely different world. And if you, you know, are paying attention, you kind of realize that this divide between like wealthy white Upper East Siders and like people who live in Spanish Harlem is like a, there's a lot going on there, right? It's about race. It's about the economy. It's about policing. It's about access to, to transportation. Uh, like the fact that when you cross this street, suddenly like, the stores are different. The, the parking space situation is different. Um, like the frequency of drugstores or like the frequency of police cars, the music coming out of buildings, like all of these things are different on each side of that street. And I was like, why, you know, in, when you're describing a city, like that's the kind of thing that clues the readers in to what kind of city you're writing in. That's kind of what you're talking about there, Lara. makes me think a lot of China Mieville's The City in the City. I love that book. I was recommending it to my partner just last night. Yeah, where there are these two different cities and they kind of exist in the same physical space, but are separate by semi-magical social conventions. Um, there's actually a BBC adaptation that I haven't, I haven't been able to watch yet, but um, I don't know, it just made me think of that. Yeah. Um, and, and what I really like about that book is that, oh man, this is a spoiler. And I always hate it when people spoil China Mieville books, because I feel like one of the most amazing things about his fiction is that you spend a lot of the time thinking you're reading one story. And when you get to the end, it's like someone pulled a carpet out from under you and you're like, oh my God, I was reading a different story the entire time. Um, so I guess if you don't want it spoiled, like cover your ears now. Um, but one of the things that is so amazing about that book is that everyone has just agreed, right? They've all just agreed that this is how things are. And, mm -hmm. and they've like trapped themselves in this notion that there's two different cities and the cities can never interact just because we all decide. And then there's like a, there's a, an, a, an authority that enforces that, right? Like breach enforces the idea that the two cities are separate and that people who live in them will never mingle or interact. Yeah. Um, but, but I feel like, I mean, I, I guess I jumped ahead a little bit there with the Chinese Mievo, but I feel like in the sort of the time that I've been reading fantasy, there was this whole development, right? Where first you had people start calling fiction urban fantasy, which sort of implies that there's, that the sort of default state of fantasy is not urban, right? It's sort of pastoral or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And then urban... Uh, yeah, so, so you had sort of like... I, I think there was sort of like Lord of the Rings, kind of like people just imagine mostly takes place out in the wilderness. And then you had an urban fantasy where, you know... At, at first, it seems like it was mostly like Charles DeLint kind of. You have like real cities and then there are like... Mer maybe there's mermaids in the harbor or something like that. And then the term urban fantasy kind of became associated with, um, you know people dating werewolves and vampires and stuff. And then, you know, then you had authors like China Mieville and the new weird come in and, and do diff completely different takes on cities and Jeff Vandermeer and all this stuff. Um, I guess kind of Brian, are you, um, I don't know how um, involved are you in the fantasy world? Were you um, following all this stuff I'm talking to talking about? Does this seem sound familiar to you? Yeah. Um, a lot, actually. Uh, I, I read a lot of Charles DeLint um, as a, uh, in a cocoon, <laughs> waiting to be a writer butterfly, uh, kind of person. Um, and, and, and that informed a lot. And, uh, some of the early stuff that, you know, like you said, it, it kind of bled, bled from urban fantasy into paranormal romance. Um, you know, stuff like Laurel K. Hamilton. I, I really loved, uh, especially her early first couple of books, um, were really more in the urban fantasy uh, side of things. Um, but that became kind of a marketing term more than an actual descriptor, I think. Um, 
and then but yeah i've 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 loved reading about about cities but but like you're saying you know there was kind of a uh it, at least it seemed to me as a reader there did seem to be uh kind of a shift not that there haven't been there haven't always been uh people writing about cities um you know you've got like verconium and dahlgren and, and those sorts of things um even even i think before if i'm not mistaken i think even before uh charles de lint um but you know i i always really kind of wanted to to write about cities you know i uh and so to to me there's there's something kind of magical um horrible and and awful sometimes but also something something kind of magical about um all of these people living in in one place uh and and having all of those things you know it's 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 like a generation ship or and i'm i'm not making any kind of uh analogy that hasn't been made um probably better but uh you know so those those ideas of of all those different cultures coming together and and that sort of thing that that really was where the the fantasy i think came from for me was was that magic of all of those people together at once yeah, I think I also just want to note that I think that there was sort of even going back before the um, term urban fantasy was coined, you did have kind of this distinction in fantasy between epic fantasy and sword and sorcery. And I feel like right. sword and sorcery was always much more associated with cities. You would have like Fritz Leiber's Lankmar, um, I think was a really influential sword and sorcery kind of city. So there was stuff like that. Um, I know, Sam, what do you think about this, this sort of history of fantasy cities I'm, I'm laying out here? I don't know. I'm really bad at genre distinctions, and, and I'm generally confused about the genre of anything I'm writing, writing or reading at any given moment. Um, but I do think that, like, you know, think, I'm thinking a lot about science fiction lately, and, um, you know, I think that that's always been a sort of um, function of modern science fiction uh, is this imagining how cities will be different. I mean, you think about something like Metropolis um, and, and you know, when, when we imagine what the future will look like, we're often trying to imagine what cities, how cities will be different or, or how people will live differently. And cities are such great sort of laboratories for or windows onto how, you know, what will, what will uh, class inequity look like? What will technology deployment look like? You know, you think about something uh, like the wind up girl by Paolo Bacigalupi and you, you sort of see this incredible, you know, panopticon of like, you know, in a, you know, dramatically different future where there's all kinds of technology, how will that impact how we are as humans and how we treat each other? Um, you know, Brian mentioned Dahlgren, which is one of my favorite novels. Uh, and, you know, it's this sort of counterculture embodied, right? This, this, the, the sixties and seventies escape from, uh, the rigid straight and narrow d definition of what American life is into this place where the laws of physics don't apply anymore. And there might be two moons in the sky and there's tons of kiki sacks of all varieties. Um, and you know, uh, a building might, a whole block might be on fire one day. And then the next day it, there's no buildings there at all. And then the day after that, the buildings are back and it looks like they've never been burned. So, you know, you can just have so much fun with the city and, uh, and, and imagine so many things, um, um, so I think that, uh, that's, that's something that, that science fiction writers at least have been obsessed with, uh, uh, for a while. I heard Samuel Artelini talking about Dahlgren recently, and he was saying that he started writing it in New York and finished writing it in San Francisco. And so that city of Bologna kind of has characteristics of both. I thought that was pretty interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I see. I see that. Um, and, and, but, but those are both really different like you know i mean that book was was published in 76 i want to say like uh new york city in 76 is very different than new york city in 2018 and so is san francisco um and so you know reading it now you sort of uh it's this window into another time and another another world and another city as filtered through a, a brilliant imagination trying to do accomplish a lot of things and and succeeding in really flipping us fl flipping the whole world on its on its head yeah. Well, if we're going to get into cities and science fiction, let's sort of lay out what some of the major types are, right? So you have kind of like Trantor from Asimov's Foundation. You have just sort of like the giant, super technologically advanced city that covers the whole planet. Um, and then you have the Blade Runner city where it's all like uh, raining and polluted air and, you know, lots of neon lights and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
those are like I, I guess you have the root you know, like the, the sort of ruins post apocalyptic kind of bombed out city. Um, I don't know. Like, like, what are some other are there other types of cities that appear in science fiction? Well, um, one of my favorite uh, writers talking about future cities uh, is uh, Kathleen Ann Goonan, um, mostly because she she did me the excellent favor of uh, having a future in which New Orleans makes it. <laughs> I think it was uh, Queen City Blues, uh, where it's it's basically like this giant raft city that they just kind of float out into the Gulf and uh, secede from the you know all the other stuff that's going on. Um, so so yeah, so I I have a lot of trouble with being in New Orleans and and future cities because you know it's not something I think a lot of other people notice, but if you if you go through a lot of the fiction. Um, and it, it has to, I'm sure it has to do partly with the precarious nature of, of the city that I live in right now. Um, but if you, if you look at a lot of the fiction, uh, even if it's not set in New Orleans, one of the, one of the ways that they like to show, you know, bad things happened in the past and now we're, we're in this different kind of future is New Orleans is gone in some horrific way. Uh, you know, the Justin Cronin's, um, vampire books, it became this just a giant uh, prison. Um, you know, it's been flooded. It's been bombed. It's been just kind of destroyed in every pretty much every possible way uh, that you can imagine. So, you know, one of my favorites is is definitely, and she she's and she she's always got some kind of really weird thing going on with cities. I remember this one book. I can't remember which one it was, um, where where there was this communication system that were these giant flowers that were being pollinated by like cybernetic bees that um so you know a, a future city doesn't necessarily have to be uh a, a microcosm of dystopia sometimes it's uh it's a it's a way of optimism i think even when it's maybe not even necessarily earned well yeah so floating cities you just reminded me that's that's one and then you've also got your domed cities and your which may be underwater and your um subterranean cities um about Lara, are you are you a, into cities in science fiction are there any any that you like so I actually just had the very great privilege of reading a novel uh, the debut novel by l x Beckett um who it, it doesn't have a title yet because it hasn't hasn't come out yet. <laughs> it's still in edits. Um, but in so in this novel, which takes place like not in the distant future, but in in sort of like a future that is on the other side of a lot of stuff from where we are now, um, cities have become like densification centers because like humanity is trying to reclaim. They're trying to rewild the earth. And, and so that they can like farm oxygen and make the planet livable, um, because like we've, we've screwed up so much of the environment. So instead of having like suburban sprawl and have people like driving cars everywhere and flying, they've, they've densified. Um, so people have been forcibly relocated into cities and even the cities are becoming these like, there are like green towers everywhere and, and everything. And like, you can sort of pick up jobs as you go. So like, as you're going through the city, you can like weed a green tower or like, it, it was just this really wonderful futuristic sci-fi city environment that wasn't like the dome city or the bombed out city or like the dystopian city. It was like, here's a vision of the sci-fi city that could work um which like as much as we talk about science fiction being like the way that we see our way forward um i feel like so much of it is sort of like grim and hopeless right like the blade runner city is not a place that anyone would want to live and in fact people who have the money go off world uh like that is not a future i want to look at and and go yes i i can see why, my way clear to living in like the the la of of like rain and toxic waste and sad robots like i don't <laughs> i don't want to live in that la i want to live in like la with mist catchers and green towers and and cool virtual reality setups like that's Come on, that's Laura, the sense of adventure <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, well, so Sam, your story is a floating city, right? I don't know if we said that explicitly. Would you, you want to talk about sort of imagining a, a floating city? Yeah, well, let me first say that one other type of city that I think uh, that I really love um, in science fiction that often gets sort of like lumped into the the dystopian city that I but I think that is there's more going on is looking at like, like the sprawl in William Gibson's sprawl trilogy and, and really all of William Gibson's novels, which spoiler alert, I ripped off a lot from William Gibson in Blackfish City. Just don't tell anybody. <laughs> um, and so, you know, in those cities, which in many ways are very Blade Runner-y in terms of the fact that like, you know, there have been consequences to centuries of industrial uh, uh, bad decision making, um, but they're also like you know you know really gnarly tech and really cool people who are scraping by and creating cool art um, and and you know like you know sort of the way we do now in cities, which is fi- carve out meaningful lives amid the nonstop horror that we uh, are surrounded by, um, because we we can also find the, the beautiful things as well. Um, so that that is something that I I really dig and why I don't think that some like there's more to dystopia often or we or we use dystopia to mean hellhole um but but there's actually more going on um and and with blackfish city that was that was definitely what where my head was at of like something that to to outsiders um and maybe to some readers will look like a nightmare um and a horrible place right after rising sea levels have transformed the globe and there are refugees from all over the world trying to resettle um because coastal cities all over the world have flooded um so you have this like hundreds of thousands of uh people living in this basically a giant oil rig um of a city um and you know all the ways in which that's grimy and sooty and messy and 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 gritty um but also like man they have really good noodles and you know there's really cool uh new forms of music that are being developed and you know people are uh forging a new world for themselves and their families and their loved ones um you know the way that humans have always done um so you know m- my floating city and and i think you know the the cities that that really uh excite me you know i mean i think about amberlo um and i think about oh okay well there's a fascist uprising and you know we're we're pretty much all screwed but like you know this nightclub is slamming <laughs> uh and uh i can still hear some really good music um and really funny comedy and uh so on did you draw a map of your city sam um I did. I mean, Kanak is very has a very straightforward um, layout. It's basically just an asterisk uh, with eight arms in the middle of the ocean. So it was a pretty pretty easy map to make. Um, uh, just several uh, lines crossing. Um, but did but, you but say yeah, this, did... this neighborhood is this kind of neighborhood, and this kind of neighborhood is this kind of neighborhood, or? Yeah, and that all gets laid out pretty early on in the book of like, you know, the the arm one is where the rich people live and arm eight is abject poverty. And the higher you go, the the worse it gets so that, you know, arm two is better than three, but worse than one and so on. Um, so, yeah, I do. I do think that's important to sort of, uh, you know, draw that draw that map for people, whether it's a physical map or a socioeconomic map or a magic map or a, you know, a voting district map. You know, when I used to play Dungeons and Dragons, there's the Forgotten Realms setting and you could, they, they just had these books and there were just hundreds of city maps, you know, for made up cities. And that always seems like an enormous amount of work. I always wonder when you get to city <laughs> number 89 or something, you're like, oh crap, what can I do? That's not the same as one of the other cities I already did. Um, I'm sure somebody really loved that work. Yeah. <laughs> some 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 wonderful person was making a lot of maps and really like living the dream. I don't know if you guys have seen there's this guy James Sutter, he's been on the show a couple of times, but he's one of the co-creators of the Pathfinder game. Um but he had this viral post recently about how if he, if someone submitted New Orleans, the New Orleans city map to him for a role-playing game that he would reject it as completely implausible. Oh. <laughs> I I did see that and it was hilarious. He he kept <laughs> There were, and so there were. One of the things that was really interesting about that that tweet, or it was actually a thread because he was he pointed to different things, um, and and saying like, "What is this? This is ridiculous!" and and no one would actually build a city here, and this is this is foolish. Uh, and it was it was really amusing to me in a couple of ways. One, because I know the history of New Orleans, and no, it it shouldn't have been built there. It was actually <laughs> uh, it was it was Bienville who had this brilliant idea of a of a, of a city there for um, a variety of reasons, 
Um, but he wasn't supposed to build it there. It was actually supposed to be, I think, in Mobile. Um, and so, you know, there, there, there are all these letters going back and forth, uh, you know, where, where his, his bosses essentially in France are like, Bienville, don't build the city there. And Bienville is like, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm going through a tunnel and like just <laughs> built it wherever the hell he wanted. Right. Um, and then there's, there are these other things where he point, he, he, he pointed an arrow to a, a, a straight line. Uh, of a canal and said, you know, this, this right here, uh, this is not the way water works and there's no way that this would actually, uh, happen. Uh, and it's, it's actually kind of brilliant because the thing he's pointing at is what's known as the Mr. Go, uh, which stands for Mississippi River Gulf Outlet. Uh, and that is a purely man-made construction, uh, which is absolutely horrible in terms of environmental impact. Uh, and it's there because the oil industries, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the PG rating is on this, but just imagine I'm bleeping out a whole bunch of, uh, expletives. You, you can talk swear about as much it. as you want. It's a podcast. Okay. Well, the, the fucking, uh, oil industry, uh, had just cut waterways throughout living marshland, um, that when you, when you cut marshland into right angles, it doesn't just grow back, you know, because the water keeps flowing in that artificial channel and, and it refuses to let sediment build up and and uh, plants take root. And so the very fact that he pointed this out, because it, if you look at the rest of the, the delta of, you know, surrounding New Orleans, it, it does look impossible. Um, but that that he that looks even more so because it's incredibly artificial. But it, it draws the eye because it's not just artificial, but it's damaging, uh, you know. And and so that's uh, I, I I thought the I I looked through it and my my initial reaction was well who is this? And then I realized it was a joke. And then I thought it was hilarious because of all the different things he was pointing out. Yeah, I guess so. See, Larry, did you ever draw a map for Amberloom? I did draw a map um, because I started using street names. And once I started using street names, I was like, well, shoot, I better keep track of, of the street names because the characters have lived here, you know, if not all their lives, then a really long time. And they're going to be able to remember the street names. And if I'm supposed to be in their heads, like, I need to know where things are. I need to know how to get there. Um, and there were also, there are trolley lines in Amberlo, right? So I needed to know where their trolley transfers were and, like, what route would they take on the trolley? And like, if the trolley, for instance, if the trolley wasn't working, like where, where would they go? What other trolleys would they have to take? Um, which, you know, living in New York of 2018 is, is a problem that is like a little too close, <laughs> too close to home. Um, but I, I did draw a map of the city. It's not the map that got included in the book. The map that is included in the book is the map of the country. Um, because there are some complicated sort of, political things based on the the interplay of the four states in the federation and like some disputed border territory but but the map that was actually the most useful to me as a writer was this map of like okay so if the three characters live in these parts of the city like what is around them where do they go to eat where they're you know where their drug stores <laughs> Um, and, and I actually now, so I've scanned it into my computer and now I have this problem of, of working, I'm working on the third book in the trilogy now. And normally I would keep the map when I was writing the first one, I kept the map right next to me. And I, every time I created a new street, I would sort of like pencil it in and be like, okay, well, this is where the new street is. And now that I've scanned it in, I, I mean, I guess like, <laughs> hmm, as I say this, I'm like, I guess I could put it in Photoshop and just like draw on it <laughs> with digital pens. Um, but like it, it's, I thought it would be convenient to have it on my computer so I could open it up whenever I needed it, but not having the physical object of the map to doodle on as I create the city is actually kind of frustrating. And now I'm worried that I'll forget all the new streets that I've created for book three because I haven't been writing them down. Did you ever make that public, that map? I didn't. I actually really want to frame it and hang it on my wall, but I have never made it public. And now I'm like, oh, I should tweet it. Um, 
And, and actually, like, as I was talking about this, I realized that the process of creating this map as I created streets, so like street by street, I would kind of build it, is kind of the way that cities really do get built or, or old cities, right? Because now we have like grid planning and, and, and urban design, but like organic cities that grew up from just like a clump of people and then more people coming did kind of like, that's why old parts of cities don't really make sense and aren't on a grid. They're just this like jumble of bizarre streets that you get lost in really easily. Um, so that's kind of fun. I accidentally made a city in the way that humans have been making cities for centuries. With all due respect to my many friends who are urban planners, I don't know that modern city planning is any better um, <laughs> than, than medieval times. I think it's really just like a bunch of people who are like, okay, well, here are all the shitty facts on the table. Um, here are all the things we can't change because of whatever. Uh, so let's try to uh, minimize, like maybe we can, maybe a bike lane, like maybe. Like, also maybe like the tree. Like the, the money that goes into it too. It's another example of like people just trying to get rich and not caring who they fuck over. Um, the, so before I lived in New York, I lived in Louisville, Kentucky, where they're, so they're on a river, right? Which means there's riverfront property, which is pretty valuable or should be pretty valuable or should be given over to like green space. Like you should do something with riverfront property, right? Like something should be done with it. And they built a highway there. <laughs> like they put a highway right on the river and it, it became like, people are still really angry about it. Um, there's like a group of people who are trying to get them to move the highway, which is this insanely expensive endeavor that will probably never happen. And then the city sort of belatedly was like, Oh, we should put a park on the river, but the park is like immediately underneath the highway right now because the highway was there first because somebody made a lot of money putting a highway there. Did you ever consider, Lara, using an alternate version of, like, Paris or something, and then you just change, just change whatever you need to for your story, but then you would already have the, the map and the street names and everything? Like, did that... Could you talk about why you didn't do that, or...? Um, I love alternate history. I think alternate history is great. I, I don't know why I didn't want to... It never occurred to me. Like, the honest truth is that it never occurred to me to create this story in a city that already existed because I wasn't thinking about like the utility of using a, a pre-existing city, right? I was thinking about the story of the characters who had come to me and like figuring out how, like what the physical space that their story took place in. Like I, the physical space grew up around the necessity of the narrative. Um, so like whatever the narrative required, the city could become that. Uh, and I, yeah, it was never to me a story that took place in a city that already existed. It was a story that germinated a city around it. Um, all right. So how about, let's talk about some of our favorite cities. I guess we mentioned a couple, but Brian, do you have any other uh, favorite cities in fantasy and science fiction you want to talk about? Um, well, you know, like everybody else, I really liked, um, the city in the city, uh, from, from China Mieville. Uh, oh, and no, also no, in terms don't, of... don't say like everybody else, like we had a vote on this. I'm sorry. Go on, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, I, I really liked, um, I also really liked, uh, the way, uh, embassy town worked. Um, and actually, I mean, we could just go through China Mieville, I guess. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, new crows of on is pretty cool too. Um, and now that I'm trying to think of them, they're all slipping out of my grasp. No pressure. There's uh, no pressure. Yeah, no did, pressure. Did you guys get a chance to look at the list of our listener suggestions on Facebook? Yes. And that? oh my God, there are so many cities, like half, three quarters of those cities. I was just like, I've never even heard of this, but I did think it was really funny that someone was like, what is this obsession with canals? Cause they had listed a whole <laughs> bunch of fantasy cities that had canals in them. Yeah, that was in reference to Scott Lynch's Camor was one of them. And, you know, I've read, like, I've beta read for people who have have fantasies that take place in cities with canals. And it's just like, I guess it's because it's something different, right? But the number of books that I've read where it's like, it's a city unlike any city on Earth. It has canals. And it's like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Canals. I guess, um, I guess really for me, less than, less than, um, 
you know, fantasy cities that, that exist in the, in the, the literature for me, um, I really like just reading little histories about actual cities and then trying to imagine how I would make them into fantasy. Uh, you know, like Venice to me is, is like that, that's an impossible city, you know? And so, uh, you know, in my, in my head, there's a, there's a, a fantasy version of, of Venice. And, and to me, I think a lot of, a lot of cities, you know, to, if you haven't actually been there, um, they, they are their own kind of fantasy, you know, where you, where you have an idea of what this, kind of like, uh, what Laura was saying, where she has this idea of what New York is like, um, that, that is in and of itself kind of fantasy. And I'm really kind of just covering because I, I'm, I'm pissed at myself because I can't think of any good <laughs> examples right now. How about Sam? Can you think of any good examples? Um, I mean, I mentioned the, the wind up girl already. Um, and I, that was, you know, I had, I, I read that book before I actually visited Bangkok. Um, and when I did visit Bangkok, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, they're going to be fine. Like if any place on earth is going to serve, is going to survive rising sea levels. Um, I bet you it would be, ban be Bangkok. So, um, in a way the fictional city really shaped my experience of, uh, and prefigured my, my, my love for the actual city, because I mean, it is an amazing place and it is, uh, uh, the, the book does a great job of, of, of bringing it to life. Um, but yeah, my, I've, I've mentioned my favorites, mostly things like Bologna in, in Dahlgren. Um, and you know, I mean, I probably wouldn't enjoy living in the Blade Runner city, but if I did live there, I would I would uh make the most of it and I would be I would be determined to find the the boy sex robots because one thing that Blade Runner has a lot of <laughs> it's sex robots. Um but they're all they're all women and you know, I feel like this like I'm hard pressed to imagine all the gay guys going off planet. Um so <laughs> You know, I feel like there's like, you know, there's a whole untapped narratives to be told about about um, the, the Blade Runner Los Angeles. So you could write some erotic Blade Runner fanfic. I don't know if that's. Uh... I, I, I mean, I'm not saying I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we'll swap AO3 names after this, Sam. <laughs> awesome. Well, actually, speaking of um, rising sea levels and canals, I want to mention Kim Stanley Robinson's New York 2140 which is, you know, is set in the future. And so New York has become a city of canals. And I guess if you like canals, it's looking, <laughs> looking, looking pretty good for you because there's going to be lots of cities of canals uh, in the future. Um, let me see what, what things people, listeners mentioned. Um, oh, actually, let me also mention there's a really cool city in Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson's 2312 where there's a city called Terminator and it's on Mercury. And uh, it's built on rails. And as the sun comes over the horizon, uh, the light from it or the heat from it causes the rails to expand and that pushes the city along. So the city always stays, you know, on the, the Terminator, the halfway between um, light and dark. Because um, obviously if it, you know, stayed fully in the sun, it would just get melted. Um, so there's that. Let's see, people mentioned... Um, Cities in Flight by James Blish, where there's a device called a spin dizzy, and it allows cities to just sort of like rise up into the sky and fly off into outer space and have adventures in outer space. Didn't somebody um, mention Mortal Engines too? Mortal Engines, with the... yeah. Mm. Yeah, have you re have you read that, Lara? I did. I read it in college uh, with the like the the like manifestation of Darwinism in this sort of like city eat city, uh, and like the amazing thing about it is that he. I, if I'm remembering this correctly, he kind of holds off on like, I think you see a big city eat a small city early in the book, but it's not particularly like vividly described. And he holds off a long time until he shows you what happens when like one big city eats another one. And it's this like visceral, horrifying, like crunching amalgamation. Um, yeah. Yeah. I did just, read just it. Just the cities they're on. Tre like wheels or treads or something. yeah they're like on tank treads and they prowl the wastes looking for smaller cities to devour uh which sort of leaves you with the question like when uh and and this is sort of uh, if i remember correctly again like a central question of the text is like what happens when all the when one city has devoured all other cities there's a trailer i saw a trailer for this right there's a movie coming out what mm -hmm. yep I think, yeah, I have seen it, and um, yeah, that that uh, 
that story, I, I read a short story, I think, set in that world um, and then kind of forgot about it and always thought it was this kind of weird fever dream um, <laughs> that I had had about, you know, cities eating other cities. Uh, and then I saw the trailer for that and it was it was this really weird moment where it was like, it was like someone had 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 ventured into a, a this weird fever dream that I had. Uh, and then I went and Googled it. And I was like, oh, no, no, I, I read a short story there once. That wasn't just me. Although I did, I did remember one of my favorite, um, fantasy cities, if I could, if I could jump in, um, KJ, uh, Bishop's The Etched City. Uh, and it's, it's this, this weirdly magical place with, uh, with like river caimans with, uh, flowers growing out of their bellies. And, uh, yeah, it, it's just this brilliantly odd, evocative novel. Yeah, I always, um, I always wanted to read that. I never got a chance to read it, but I remember the cover really vividly. Always looked really cool. Yeah, it's definitely a good one. Oh, did anybody bring up Robert Jackson Bennett in any of the comments? Because like his books are literally called City of, and they all like they take place <laughs> in different cities, but all the cities are so incredibly vividly described, and they all have like their own thing going. Um, yeah, I I really enjoy his urban descriptions. I don't remember if anyone, I have a feeling maybe one person did, I'm not sure, but it seems like City of whatever. It's pretty That's a pretty big indicator. <laughs> it's a pretty good indication there's a city in the book. Yeah, but it seems like it's just a popular way to title books these days. Yeah, I, I, it worked out well for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody, there's a, isn't it, it's um, like S.A. Chakraborty or something, City of Glass. Somebody oh, yeah, yeah. Brass. City, city of Brass. Brass. City of Brass. City of Brass. City of Brass. City of Brass. Yeah. Yeah. I had that out of the library to read it. And then someone else requested it, so I couldn't <laughs> renew it. Another really great uh, fantasy city that I read recently was The Waking Engine by David Edison. <gasps> yes. A couple of years ago. Oh. And that was like this amazing, like massive multiverse city where everybody goes when they die. Um, and uh, where like, you know, people from millions of realities um convene because it's you know you you are reborn again and again in different worlds until you come to this one city which is the only place where the true death can be found um and it's brilliant and like scary and edgy and sexy yeah it's mm. really good and it actually uh i've started recently reading chandler clang smith's the sky is yours um and i i was like i don't know what to compare this to because i was trying to describe it to someone and I ended up comparing it to The Waking Engine because it's the first book I've read since I read that one that was so freaking weird. Like, it's so bizarre. And the, a large part of how weird it is is the city that it takes place in. It's like this grungy, falling apart, weird, disgusting kind of version of New York, but it's never called New York. And there are dragons and, like, Part of the city has just become a prison, but it's been a prison so long that people just are born there. <laughs> like, it, and when I when I was trying to describe what it reminded me of, it was wake, the Waking Engine, which is similarly like this indescribably bizarre but incredibly rich city. Two of the cities that I've really liked uh, lately, if I can kind of fudge the definition into like generation ships, which. <laughs> Those to me are cities that are just, they happen to have a very specific kind of purpose. Um, uh, but, um, River Solomon's An Unkindness of Ghosts, uh, is, is very obviously meant to be, uh, a, 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 a city kind of deconstructed and reconstructed into this, into the starship. Uh, and it's a, it's a, a haunting, really great novel. Um, and then, um, Numenon, uh, by, uh, Marina Lofstetter. I think that's her name. I, I'm blanking on her name all of a sudden. Uh, but Numenon is this, this other, it's a, it's a collection of ships that make up a single kind of convoy that's going to a, a star and coming back. Um, and that, that was also a really interesting kind of breakdown of, of how cities might work in a, in a vacuum and with a, with a goal in mind. Um, which, which, you know, is, is an interesting kind of a thing to think about for a city, uh, which is, you know, some cities, the, the goal seems to be like, like in New Orleans, for instance, the goal of, 
the city and, a, and a, the kind of collective uh, enterprise we're all engaged in is, is basically like keeping the water out of the city. Um, and so, you know, to me, to sometimes when I think about cities, I like to think that they might have a, a common goal or an idea, uh, which I guess kind of goes against Sam's idea of cities, which is that they're, they're war, uh, war paths. But, you know, I think maybe that they could be a little bit of both. Yeah, both are true. Like we're we're all horrible and trying to destroy each other and we're all wonderful and trying to live together and make something beautiful and unique and wonderful. Right. Well, when you're talking about how do cities work, there was a funny conversation we were having on the Facebook page where um one of my friends Tom, he was talking about how, you know, if you have a city that covers the whole planet, what do they where does the sewage go and stuff like that? <laughs> and so, you know, where do they throw their throw their trash? And so, as mentioned, there's actually a funny treatment of this. There's a book called "Build a Galactic Hero" by Harry Harrison, and in that, they just uh, they use the post office and they just mail all their garbage from Earth off to different uh, ad- random addresses elsewhere in the galaxy. Uh, awesome. Another one, another. Um, I guess it's not just one city, but in Max Gladstone's craft sequence, there are. Mm. I feel like there are several cities um, that different the different books take place in, but the the world is so uh, real and 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 it's such a great magic system, and it's such a such a cool history to this world that the the sort of like death of gods and the enslavement of gods and the the use of magic and and who can use magic and how they where their power comes from, um, you know, sort of takes shape in the. City city uh uh in different ways and and sort of shapes the city um and that that is that i really love i really love the way max does that yeah i mean where you've read those books right i have yeah and and i've heard him talk about them and before before i had read them i I, like i started reading them because i heard him talk about his magic system which was essentially like my books are an analogy for the financial crisis except the (laughs) banks are gods and like we've killed the gods but but semi resurrected them and like now they only do the bidding of the people who know kind of how to control this this god bank system uh which is i mean kind of how yeah like it's how money works right like only some people understand how how to make the banking system and like m- amounts of money that large really work for them uh which i think is like like hearkening way back to the beginning of this conversation and talking about like people who control real estate in cities, um, like the amount of money and the amount of power that you can control if you can control like real estate in a city. I think like Max's cities feel really real because there is this vast imbalance of power and like some people who can make things happen just by like snap, snapping their fingers and other people who are like carried along on tides of things that they don't understand and have no control over. Uh, and like that feels very real to me. <laughs> that feels like how Same. things work in the real world. That sort of reminds me, you know, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago now, I guess I interviewed Michael Shermer and he was saying that he thinks the city state is going to make a big comeback. I mean, because if mm. you think about it for most, most of history, people, the, the, center of political organization was the city you know there wasn't really nation states and as cities get more and more populous um you know and and and, you know i guess there's been a lot of discussion about how how a country like the united states is just becoming ungovernable there's just too many people who want too many different sorts of things and i don't know do you think in the future cities might just like say to hell with this where you know we've got 20 million people that's good enough for a country you know we're making ours we're becoming our own country now I don't know, but I'd like to see it happen more in fiction. Uh, I feel like city states are are underutilized. Um, like, I'm trying to remember the name of the series. There was a series when I was in high school. Oh man, it was about, but it was about essentially like kids who could, when they fell asleep, like travel to this alternate version of Italy, like Renaissance Italy. And so each book took place in a different Italian city state. Um, and like that part of history is just fascinating to me when like Italy was, was ruled as this sort of series of squabbling. It was essentially like a whole bunch of very small countries, um, in what today is now one big country. Um, but, but then like it was enough space 
that it could sustain these like multiple political entities. And I think that's really an interest, like, because, because now we live in, in this world that we live in where like some countries are so big and they have, are perceived to have like a singular political will and they act on a global stage. I think people don't, don't conceive of fiction that happens on kind of like a, a smaller scale like that. But I think it, it's, I don't know. I find, I find that political structure really fascinating, which is maybe, maybe why I wrote a book that takes place in a federation of four small city states. <laughs> I don't know. I just think it's really interesting. And I'd like to see more people, uh, write stories sort of in that structure. Well, yeah. And there's been a lot of love for Venice on this panel. So. If Venice just went back to being a city state in the future, right? Seems like and of... um, so so what Laura was saying about a, a a city that you go to when you fall asleep, um, reminded me of another one of my favorite cities that I for, I can't believe I forgot to mention, uh, which is uh, Catherine Valente's uh, Palimpsest. Yes, right. And uh, the the best thing about that book is that um, you know it's not super well known but when someone who has read it hears it does exactly what Lara just did <laughs> right because it's such an amazing novel uh and I, I it's basically one of those kind of litmus tests for friendships i think you know like if if you hand someone palimpsest and they don't get through it and they don't like it well i mean just don't hang out with them anymore and this is the city you have to have sex with someone who's been there in order to right. be able to go there a right. venereally so like transmitted a, city. Yeah. And it it gives you a tattoo of of a map of part of the city um somewhere on your body. Uh and and so the only the only way to get there is by sleeping with someone else who or the only way to find a new place in the city is by sleeping with someone who well not sleeping with, having sex with someone who has a different part of the city tattooed on them. So there's this like collection of people who are who are seeking out, you know, different like oh well you have that street so guess what? <laughs> uh, but there's a lot more to it than that, and it's a it's a very I, I think I've used the word evocative too much in this discussion, but that that the the it's the whole novel feels like a just a beautiful tone poem uh, on top of all the other interesting stuff that's going on in it. Yeah, and Kat actually just, like, now that you've brought her up, I'm like, all her cities are amazing. I just recently yeah. read Radiance, and, like, that book mm -hmm. is packed full of incredible cities. And, like, the, the Orphan's Tales books, too, have, have just cities on cities on cities. And all of them are, are incredibly different from one, one another and just, like, bizarre and imaginative. Um, she, yeah, I, I don't know where she comes up with all of them like she's have a hat and she's like pulling cities out and being like and this city will be here and this one will be on pluto and it will have you know i i don't even know i can't even like think of half of the things that she's come up with do the cities feel like american cities or do they feel do they have a different sort of character to them in palimpsest yeah or i guess in her other books that, that you've read um i don't know they they feel so unto themselves that I really couldn't, they feel like, like they're from where they're from, you know? So they don't, they don't necessarily feel European or, or American, at least to me that Palimpsest to me felt like, like it belonged in dream, you know? And that's, uh, because it was so of itself. Cause one of our listeners, Alicia Brenner says that it feels like, you know, every, you know, so many cities in science fiction feel like Blade Runner and so many, cities and fantasy feel like Lord of the Rings. And she says, why are they so similar? Um, because it's intrinsic to how cities develop in the West and what makes others different, Afro-futurist influences, et cetera. Um, so I guess, yeah, are there, are there cities in fantasy and science fiction that have a distinctly non-Western, um, you know, character that you, that you guys can think of that you like? Um, I just read uh, *Beast Made of Night* by Toshio Nyabuchi, which is a new young adult novel, which takes place in a sort of Nigerian-influenced uh, fantasy world um, that is really brilliant and and uh, uh, has a, a very sort of fresh and non-Western feeling city. Uh, there was another example. Wait, somebody had. 
No, I can't think of uh, it. Children, uh, Tomi Adeyemi's Children of Blood and Bone, I have not read yet, but um, people are uh, pretty excited about the sort of uh, uh, world building and and the sort of ways that, that actual African geography and history are, are made fantastic and, and transformed in that book. Oh my gosh, this is like one of those those moments where it's like, I know I have, but right. now that someone has asked me, <laughs> everything has fallen oh, oh, out the back oh, of my head. Oh, oh, I got another one. Um, G. Willow Wilson's A Leaf the Unseen. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is really brilliant, and that's like a very Middle Eastern city. Um, it's not, it's an, an unnamed a uh, Arab oil emirate, but uh, it is it is amazing and feels very, very different. Um uh, Saladin Ahmed's Throne of the Crescent Moon is also similarly um, uh, f fresh feeling. Oh, I remember the one. The other one people were mentioning mentioning was um, George Alec Effinger's um, When Gravity Fails, which I think is also sort of mid. I haven't read it, but I think it's also sort of a Middle Eastern kind of setting. Um, I guess I'll mention a couple other just kind of cool ideas people mentioned in the comments here. So Bruno Onkir says. Um, there's a book by Stanislav Lem called Return from the Stars. Uh, and he says that in it, these astronauts come back to Earth after a 127-year mission in space. And um, and they have to like just learn how to get around in this city. He says the first chapter, they're just trying to navigate public transportation. And, you know, after 100 years. And he says, imagine an 18th century man having to find his Uber ride. Um, <laughs> so that sounds pretty interesting. I actually just had this conversation with a cab driver. I was in Ottawa uh, and I was talking to this guy who had come from Somalia and he was describing like arriving in Ottawa and, if, and having a conversation with a friend who had been like trying to meet someone on a street corner and the friend had been like, well, where are you? And he said, I'm where, I'm where the blinking hand is. And the friend was like, what do you mean? And he's like, I'm at the corner where there's a sign with a blinking hand. And, he, and his friend, who had lived in <laughs> Ottawa for like years and years, said all the, all the street corners have that. That's the walk sign, which like, like he was saying, when you first arrive in a new place, mm -hmm. you just don't know, like everything is different to you, right? So... So every city, like every city on earth, every city in fantasy, if you're new to it as a character or a reader, you're going to have that moment of like, I'm on the corner with the blinking hand. And someone is going to be like, all the corners have blinking hands in this city. Um, right. Like you just have never been in it before. So like you have to, you have to orient yourself every time you arrive in a new place. And, and sometimes you're going to be like, oh, hell no, I hate this place. I'm leaving immediately <laughs> in the real world and in books. You, you mm -hmm. get in one chapter and you're like, this is this is just not going to work for me. Um, this is too much or not enough. Well, I guess as the writer, you have to present the city in a way that the reader is not going to be totally lost. Right. You have to, especially at the, the weirder it is, you know, you have to think about who your viewpoint characters are and what aspects of the city they encounter in what order and kind of lay it out in some sort of logical order. And unless that, that feeling of disconnect is, is kind of what you're going for. You know, if you want them to feel like, okay, I know what that is. It's a blinking hand. Um, and then to have that, that moment of, I don't know what anything really means anymore. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, um, of Borges's, uh, Tlon, Ukbar Tertius Orbit, you know, where it's the, uh, it's a, it's a city, it's a, it's a fictional city in a fictional country and on a fictional planet that impacts the world in this, in, in a really weird way that doesn't ever kind of make sense. And that, that not making sense is kind of part of it, I think. This is or maybe the city, I'm just not right, smart that, enough to, that people like Boris. create a mythology around it. And right. like, and make it real by their, by their sort of recording facts about it. Right. Yeah. I love it. I'm actually pretty amazed that it took me an hour and a half in a conversation about cities to, to turn to Borges. <laughs> I, yeah, mean, I wasn't going to say stick. anything, but. <laughs> um, 
And then this Zach Chapman mentioned this thing. Um, it sounds a little bit like something Sam was mentioning earlier. He, he says uh, there's a book by C.J. Cherry called Sunfall that's a fix-up about different cities in Earth's far future. She describes Paris as a sealed city where no one remembers the outside. Inside, when people die, they're reincarnated somewhere else in the city. Um, in the same book, New York is just one enormous high-rise that's crumbling under its own mass, but is also growing wider and taller. The main character in that story is a builder that hangs off the side of the structure and works on expanding it. So that sounds pretty cool. Um, and then Ross Bickford says, uh, I'm reading Red Rising. Um, this is the Pierce Brown book, right? Um, I like the idea of giant vertical cities built into the side of a canyon that makes the Grand Canyon look like a crack in the sidewalk. It isn't even that unrealistic when you think about the low gravity of Mars. Um, so I guess that's well, the I, thing, too, in, in science fiction, these, these giant cities. But, but yeah, go ahead, right. Brian. Uh, so the, the canyon city idea, um, it's, not a, it's not a thing yet, um, but I was, I was on Twitter with uh, Rebecca Roanhorse, and she was talking. Uh, she's the author of uh, Trail of Lightning, uh, and she was saying that she just got a book deal uh for a uh a Nazi kind of inspired uh fantasy world with with this city that's built into the the sides of a canyon uh with all these like flying uh conveyances and and that sort of thing so <laughs> so we have that to look forward to too yeah cool um all right any other uh Oh, let's see. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, Eon by Greg Bear, which is there is a uh, uh, I read this a long time ago, but I, I think the Earth, I think something bad happened to the Earth and humanity has moved into one of the moons of uh, one of the moons of Mars or something. And they've hollowed it out. And then they've also created this, I don't know, some sort of wormhole thing so that the it's, it's basically this tunnel that extends into infinity. And so they have infinite space to um you know, to, to settle this, this sort of infinite tunnel. Oh man. My um, immediate thought when you described that was like, what happens when the technology keeping the tunnel open fails? <laughs> As it inevitably will. This is another great thing about creating cities is that you can build into them the seeds of their own destruction. Yeah. So are there any, um, any good stories of cities, I mean, I guess that's that's maybe even a whole other topic is cities getting destroyed. But I mean, um, Venice, Venice is a city that that was built on top of its own demise. Right. Like canal cities in general, all going to sink. Right. <laughs> you people with your canals. It's just a death sentence. <laughs> oh, and then um, Ank Moorpork, the Terry Pratchett city like a lot that was actually the number one um thing that people mentioned hmm. yeah. their favorite city i don't know any you guys uh terry pratchett fans yes but i don't feel like i've read enough of the ankh morpork books like I've, I've read a lot of the books that don't take place in ankh morpork <laughs> yeah same i've not read any whenever i think of terry pratchett i think of the librarian and that library uh which you know gets us into the the library discussion, which is a whole other thing, I think. Um, so yeah, any, any ink more pork, uh, memories I have are kind of overshadowed by the, by the library, which, you know, I'm a writer, so it kind of makes sense. Mm. Well, yeah, when you're talking about libraries, I mean, that makes me think of one of the years ago, you know, when I was playing Dungeons and Dragons, I used to subscribe to Dragon Magazine. And there was this article I read that's always stuck with me where it said, it starts out and it says, inns and shops, inns and shops. I'm so sick of inns and shops. It's like every town you go to, that's all there is, is inns and shops. You know, and it's like, you mm -hmm. know, there can be other things in a city than than just inns and shops. And, and this, so this is a whole list of like museums and temples and libraries and parks and I don't know, all, all this kind of stuff. But yeah, there is this tendency in, in fantasy particularly to just have inns and shops and, and that's your whole, yeah, your whole city. Oh man, with me it's restaurants. <laughs> the number of scenes in which characters meet in a restaurant and eat a meal. Like I got a letter back from my editor on on I think my second book, and she was like, "Could your characters meet somewhere else besides a place that has food? <laughs> like, could you write a scene that isn't two people sharing a meal and having a tense conversation?" 
Why do you hate life, editor? <laughs> right? Restaurants are where it happens. So what kind of places did you change the restaurants to? <laughs> I don't think I can. I don't think I got rid of any of the restaurants. I did add like a a giant sort of like a banking conference center complex. Um because yeah, banks as as previously discussed, the center of power. Well, having characters meet at a restaurant is handy because then there's all sorts of stuff they're doing with their hands and, you know, yeah, and you know what? And going and I feel like living in New York, like that's where I meet people, right? Because most people don't want you to come to their apartment because it's small or messy or like they have roommates. <laughs> so then like I have met people in restaurants like every day since I moved here. It's sort of like a neutral territory that you can go to halfway between where you are and where they are. And like the number of restaurants in a city as big as New York is staggering. So I feel like there's something too, like, there are re cities have restaurants. Like cities have a lot of restaurants. They're a neutral space yeah. for people to meet. And and they're a space where we can um, experience and appreciate uh, all the different folks who make up our city, right? So, uh, you know, the fact that I can go to a really good Ethiopian restaurant or Chinese restaurant or Thai restaurant or uh, Turkish restaurant or any of these places is like, you know, that that didn't happen in the small town where I grew up. Mm. And it's one of the things that, like, we really value about a big city is that there's folks here from all over the world and they're amazing and they have really good food. Yeah, food mm. in cities is also like an entire other topic. Uh, Brian, did you have something you were going to say? Oh, well, I was, gonna, I was just going to say that uh, writing a New Orleans novel, uh, you'll never have an editor tell you <laughs> do less restaurants because <laughs> <laughs> it's just so much a part of the, the myth of, of the city. And it's not it's not so much inaccurate in, in the sense of a myth, but in, in, the, in the sense of that's what you think of when you think of that place. Uh, so, you know. If, if, for instance, if someone were to visit New Orleans and then ask their friends, like, what should I do in the city? It's l literally just a list of restaurants. Um, you know, then there's other stuff to do here, but, you know, that's, that's really what the best thing to do is here. Hmm. Restaurants and bars. So there's that too. Um, all right. So we're almost out of time. I did, uh, just want, also want to mention, uh, listener Arthur Schmid. Uh, references a book called Imagining Urban Futures, Cities in Science Fiction and What We Might Learn from Them by Carl Abbott. Uh, I don't know anything else about it, but it sounds really cool. Hopefully I'll be able to check it out at some point. Um, but yeah, we should probably start wrapping this up pretty soon. How about just to wrap things up, how about each of you just say some interesting, colorful detail about the city in your book that is going to make people want to read your book? So, uh, Sam, what's some kind of interesting aspects of your city that's going to make people want to read Blackfish City? Uh, it begins with a woman arriving in town with a killer whale and a polar bear at her side to uh, wreck shop and, and exact bloody revenge on people. Um, and there's really good noodles in the, book, <laughs> in the city. Man, I want to read this book just for the noodles. I feel like they keep coming up in your descriptions. I didn't realize it until he said it, but yeah, they eat a lot of noodles. <laughs> <laughs> What more is there in life? What is what is best in life? Fucking noodles. <laughs> um, then how about Brian? What's some some interesting facts about the city in your book that's going to make people want to read it? Um, well, so the 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 thing about the 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 New Orleans that I I kind of created um, is that it's it is our new orleans um but it's it's a it's a magical version of our new orleans that's that is alive and is struggling to to remain that way uh and and there's that kind of cliche of of it being of a of a setting being a character in its own right uh and so if you if you if you look at a lot of different ideas of of the soul uh, we have, you know, this kind of idea of a soul of a, as being just a, a, a ghostly reflection of, of a person. That's kind of a Western idea, but there are a lot of other ideas that say that there are, are multiple parts to our soul. Uh, and so there are, are, the soul of the city is a, a real thing in my city. Um, and, and there are, you know, parts of it that are personified by people. 
Uh, and so they, uh, they show up and, and get in the hijinks and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, if you want to visit the city, uh, all the places that I mentioned, the, the restaurants and the bars and, and the, that sort of thing, uh, they're real. So, you know, <laughs> no, no names were, pr- uh, changed to protect the innocent. So mm-hmm. if you need kind of a, a, a local's guide to, to where to get breakfast and, and where to get drunk, um, that's, that's something else you can get from the book. It's really cool. Okay, and so then, Lara, final final word here. Oh man, there's so much about about Amberlo City. Uh, there's art galleries and whorehouses and espionage and nightclubs. Uh, but the thing that I'm going to bring up, since we were talking about about food and in fiction, uh, is that there's a lot of really lush description of edibles, um, like <laughs> noodles, you know, cinnamon buns, all kinds of stuff. And I actually used to live with a chef. And at one point during the sort of ramping up for for the release of Amberlo, I collaborated with her to come up with recipes for a lot of the of the food in the book. So if you if you read it and you are interested in like in cooking, for instance, pumpernickel sticky buns with honey and pistachios, there's a recipe for that. Um, so you can actually like even though the city is completely made up and you can't go there, which is very sad, but also I was going to say also kind of comforting because it's, you know, being taken over by a fascist regime, but, uh, good I thing feel it's like, just fiction. yeah, good thing, like, <laughs> you know, it wouldn't actually be that, that much escapism. Um, at any rate, like, even though you can't go there, um, like you could with New Orleans, you can still make the food and eat it at home. Well, that's good. So Brian's book is like a novel slash travel guide and your book is like a novel slash cookbook. I mean, the recipes aren't in the book, but if you hit me up on Twitter, I could make it happen. Hmm. That definitely will happen. <laughs> Those buns sound delicious. Oh, my God. they I never even got to try them because she was living in Kentucky and I was in New York. So she just took pictures of them. <laughs> and they looked beautiful. That's cruel. Hmm. Um, all right. So I think we'll wrap things up there. So, we, so again, we've been speaking with Sam J. Miller. Lara Elena Donnelly and Brian Camp. So thanks everyone so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Sam J. Miller, Lara Elena Donnelly, and Brian Camp for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to Stephen, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Ruralution, who just made a one-time contribution to the show via PayPal. Ruralution writes, I loved the Mary Rickard interview. It was fascinating to hear someone speak who was so confident in being themselves, but also fantastic to hear the journey how she became that person. So big thanks again to Rural Lucian and to everyone else who's contributed. We really appreciate it. I also want to thank Casper for sponsoring today's show. Remember that you can get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash galaxy and using the promo code galaxy at checkout. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.